Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday, until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash ham nation. This is Tam Nation, episode number 201 for June 17th, 2015. Get your gear ready for field day. Hello, everybody. It's me, K9EID, <laughs> and you are tuned in to Ham Nation. And why am I all set up for this? We're getting ready for a field day. And there's some things you have to do for field day. You got to have all your bug sprays and stuff like that. Uh, Gordo says, I had, don't forget deodorant. You have to also, very important, you got to have your flashlights because you're going to need them. And, and they better have good batteries. And the most important thing that you're going to need, because I don't know why it is, but every field day, uh, we have a problem with uh, rain. So uh, DX Engineering have umbrellas. Uh, oh, you got to yeah. have your umbrella. And don't forget your soldering iron because something will break. I don't care what you're doing. It's going to break. But seriously, one of the most important things you need, and you really need to make sure you take this along and it's working. I have the new one, an MFJ analyzer so you know what your wow. antennas are doing it saves all that problem and uh, george will talk about this uh in, in in another show but boy i'll tell you what that new analyzer is great and last but not least i want to tell you you're going to have to take your tent get your tent all ready make sure all of the ropes and the all of the supports are ready because if you get out there and, and you forgot something you don't have another chance don't forget the camera. And we're going to talk about some of this throughout the show. We're going to have several guests on that have some great ideas about field day. But we're uh, before we go to some of those, I, I have to tell you, Tim Duffy's here. And I know what you're all thinking. How does Tim Duffy do field day with the number one contest station? He's going to tell us, and it's going to be surprising. He really is going to do a cool thing. But the guy that does really cool things around here every week is Gordon West, WB6NOA, down in Costa Mesa. How you doing, Gordo? What you doing for field day? Well, we are ready for field day. And, Victor, if you want to go ahead and roll those shots, and uh, here they come, the Gordo short shots on getting ready for field day. But before we get ready for field day, let me tell you about Hamcom in Texas this past weekend. At the new Irving Convention Center, it was a huge success. I mean, look at this. Unlike uh, other venues that you sort of get lighting, they had like searchlights and uh, huge attendance by all of the exhibitors. And of course, a major Hamcom inside flea market Look at this, Bob. For field day, we got the masts. And uh, there we are uh, in the uh, W5YI booth. And uh, that's some of the Ham Radio Outlet gang and other gang in the background. Look at all of the exhibitors. They were doing their thing. Now, unlike some ham fests, let me tell you, the Hamcom had a wonderful exhibit area for exhibitors just to munch and get away because the crowd was big. And uh, there is Maine Trading. Now look over her right shoulder. That goes bong every time they made a big sale and it was going bong a whole bunch. And that was just some of the fun we were having. Of course, Dave Sumner with the league and all of the league personnel were there just to make sure that we were on, uh, on our uh, toes. And uh, they signed up a lot of league members. 
and uh, there is associate publisher and publisher and editor, associate editor um, of uh, CQ magazine, and they're ready with their July issue. So CQ is doing just great. Now, during uh, that Sunday, of course, uh, Hamcom was over. I came home and worked the VHF contest. And during the contest on six meters, that was wide open, I kept hearing this huge signal, and I thought, what the heck is that big signal going on? Well, I found out. It was Amanda. So, Amanda, what a signal. Thank you, Amanda, for completely uh, energizing the six-meter band. Yeah, that's her signal right in the center. Monster signal. I mean... The other ones couldn't even get close to what Amanda and her team were putting out. So keep up the good work, Amanda. Well, let's talk about ham radio field day and getting on the air. First of all, for your field day site, make sure you've got a big banner so people know where to go and how to check in. And notice right between the two pillars there, we have a welcome sign because you wanna have everybody coming on site to feel welcome Kids, you name it, we've got it at Field Day. There is our city of Costa Mesa, Masac Field Day, and we'll have that Field Day going two weeks from today. Well, maybe two weeks, a week and a half, whatever it is. And make sure you have lights for at night because uh, Bob's uh, giant flashlight may give out. And notice that the antennas for Field Day are all around the perimeter, and we bring in all of the coaxes to those white tents. This allows camaraderie and having kids on scene really helps out. And as you can tell by their smiles, kids really get a kick out of field day, either HF, VHF, or UHF. Remember, stay off of 146.52, but go to 146.55 or 58 for your FM contacts. And Today, we got to talk about your coax. Now, if you got coax from DX Engineering, Tim, you get everybody squared away right. Uh, that's similar. I've opened up the top coax there, and it's got a nice 98% braid and 100% shield, and it's UV protected. The medium uh, coax in the center, look at the holes. The bottom coax, that coax stinks. Look at the holes on that. If you're above 30 megs, all that signal is going to leak out. So don't even think about using CB or bargain brand coax because look at that. They don't, it'd be like plumbing with holes in the pipes. So get good coax. There's 98% braid, as you can see, 100% shield, and we've exposed it. Uh, Tim Duffy, thank you for DX Engineering getting everybody well coaxed. Now, we want to talk about safety, and for those of you that are running the extra hard uh, coax, ones that take a kink like this, that's okay, but in the middle of the night, middle of the night, yikes, watch out! You never know what you're going to find the next morning. That's right, those things happen, so watch the loops of the coax. So someone in the middle of the night doesn't uh, take a uh, fall. <clears throat> and uh, watch your um, balance. That's a four to one balance. Don't put them right next to a metal pole. Notice how we have it spaced out. Putting that balance next to a metal pole is going to cause the antenna not to resonate like it should. So do whatever you do to get them spaced away. Now, if you're running 10 or less feet, certainly use the RG8X that you see on the top. But for those of us that really want to do it right, you're going to use the um, great uh, DX engineering line of coax cables, LMR 400 type. And that way, with all that braid, you're ready to go. But you wouldn't use a big coax for a small little uh, uh, ballon that we have here to help mitigate noise coming or signal coming back down the braid. <clears throat> so small coax does have its place. Now, here's where small coax goes back. First of all, when you solder this, you got to get rid of that 100% uh, foil braid, or the foil. Got to keep the braid. And sometimes you think, well, it's a nice, clean connection. But look at this. We took it apart, and they hadn't even soldered it. Oh, my God. So make sure 
that you wiggle the coax, make sure it's well soldered. And if you've got end connectors for your UHF station, double check for continuity. And if you've got the little chokes, put them on the smaller coax to keep the RF from coming back into your station. Now look at this. What were we thinking? Trying to assemble this antenna on the ground? Dum da dum dum. You would do much better to have sawhorses like the Orange County Amateur Radio Club has done. Look at this. They don't even have to bend over. They're having much more fun. And when you're ready to put up the antenna, make sure everybody in the area is uh, well protected, have hard hats on, and uh, know that magic word when that begins to fall. Run! And um, uh, have proper climbing harnesses. In fact, uh, uh, Jim, the Collins man, and Wayne Spring, that's not Jim and Wayne yet. Yeah, they're coming up. They were giving some pointers. First of all, they said, um, beside being safe, make sure that you have protective lenses. So when you put up that six-meter beam, and that's what we're going to have a week and a half from now. Is that pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Anyway, we uh, put it up on a telescopic mast. It's ready to roll. We got the dune buggy there just in case the beach uh, is calling. By the way, speaking of calling, the Hawaiian beacon is in today, 2,500 miles coming in on VHF and UHF. Now, you field airs, I want you to have a good-sized antenna. Take a look at this log periodic. We're going to roll the photos backwards, but if you were to put one up, you get a big crane <clears throat> and uh, um, there we go there's our big crane and uh, make sure that uh, the crane uh, is uh, capable of hoisting up this log periodic and uh, you want to get it up make sure that the fellow on the tower is well connected because when that thing goes into position clunk there we go it gets bolted down there that's the way to do it huh that only rents for about $800 an hour. And there is Jim, our Collins man that drives a Collins van, Bob's friend and Wayne Spring. And uh, they've now took that antenna down and have it as a Mars station on the East Coast. So good deal there. Now there's a more modest station. I like that. It's in the clear. It's on six meters. It's standing tall. That's a nice field day station. If you feel brave and uh, you don't have a lot of winds, you can go ahead and put up uh, one of those guys. They offer about 60 B of uh, directivity uh, and gain. And um, bring along that SWR analyzer. That's not as fancy as Bob's, but, you know, it's nice. And uh, uh, stay about two feet away from the antenna you're tuning. That's in 6JF, and he's got it going. And solar panels, yep, those are good to have. And we'll show you the latest of batteries. Oh, no, that's not the latest. This is a ho-hum battery. And um, it's ho-hum because it weighs about 60 pounds. I got one right beside me that's almost close to it that weighs four pounds. I'll tell you about that in a second. Make sure you have your band plan charts. ICOM America has the best one out there. And you text, you can operate voice from 28.3 to 28.5. So neat stuff out there. Now, be sure and repair any cords that look a little bit frayed. That looks beyond a little bit frayed. And um, uh, George turned me on to this, Sugru uh, self-setting rubber. Once you open up the package, it's going to get under your fingernails and you're going to have black stuff everywhere. But once you put it onto the cord needing repair, look at this, Bob. Wow, and that's not sticky. After about an hour, it sets up quite nice. So, quite nice. so there is hope for frayed there is cords. Hope for frayed well, cords. finally, uh, that's finally, Chip, uh, and uh, Chip is saying, I built my own, and he did. A nice little beam for, looks like 10 meters, and uh, he's ready to roll for a field day. And he's got Janet, his lovely wife, uh, KL7MF, right next to him. They're giving a thumbs up. They got the solar panel, a little bit of a shadow on it, but that's okay. But they are ready for field day. And we're hoping that you're ready too. And look at this. This is amazing. This is 24 amp hours, and it is uh, a lithium iron phosphate battery. And it's made by Shorey, S H O R A I. And this is going to be one of our buffer batteries to make sure that all of our radios don't pull too much current and begin to uh, uh, 
QSY slightly on the air. So 24 amp hours and it weighs about four pounds. Is that amazing? So that's the field day story at this end. Be sure you get the ICOM band chart because that's going to make sure you stay within your band limits and have fun. We look forward to seeing you on field day. And next week at this same time, we're going to give you the last of our field day hints. Bob, back to you. And don't forget the suntan lotion. Right on. Good stuff. Good stuff. You also want to make sure you have a guest book. Make, a, make everyone that shows up sign your guest book. Because those people might be the next amateur radio operator, some that right, just right, stop by right. to see what you're doing. And, and, and you want to uh, make sure that you have a little bit of thing going on other than radio. Here's the thing that John sent me. This is from the, the great club uh, uh, back in Illinois, W9KXQ, good friend for a long time. Their club does a lot of things. They have a really wow. neat meal. And uh, they, it, this is a big deal. I, I wish I wasn't so far. I'd go visit them because they make a big deal out of the Saturday night meal. Of course, you got to sign up, let people know you're going to be there. And uh, these are things that you can do. But the main thing is with all of that, contact your newspapers, your radio stations, and your TV stations. They will come and visit you. Because, see, it's, it's on the weekend and there's not much news going on. All the news babes are... Uh, out at the beaches or riding around, <laughs> and, and they need stories. And you got the story. And and here's a guy that can really tell us the story, and, and we're happy to have you. Tim Duffy, K3LR, how are hey, you, and what's Tim. up? From Woo! Hey, everything is great out here, Bob. I got to tell you, Gordo, I was impressed. You, you jam-packed about uh, 50 different field day hints <laughs> I got to go back and watch that again because uh, that, that, that's a great YouTube video on its own. But, you know, Field Day is that first uh, exposure to amateur radio for so many people. And especially, you know, we've been running a lot of ham classes here in our local club. It's the Mercer County Amateur Radio Club. And Bob, you and Gordo and George have all spoken to, uh, to our local club here and inspired uh, a lot of the, the new hams and the old hams alike. But I got to tell you, when I was 12 years old and went to my first field day, that is what really turned me on to this hobby. And uh, the outpouring of, come on, try this, or come on, hold this rope, uh, that experience is what set me up for a lifetime of of contest operating and emergency operating. This is... This is the best thing. You know, summertime is going out and camping and having fun with your friends. And you add in radio. Now you've got something that is just spectacular. So we're really excited this year for Field Day. Uh, we did this last year. We're going to be in, uh, in the eight echo category. That's oh, eight wow. transmitters. We'll have eight 100-watt transmitters on the air at once. And four of them will be outside here at K3LR, and four of them will be inside the, the K3LR station. And so it's a hybrid. The, the echo uh, designator means that we're running on 100% emergency power. And so we have a generator here at K3LR, and we're going to run that the entire time. It'll run everything we've got here, and we will, you know, be on for field day, both inside and outside. Now, the outside... We're going to be uh, soldering up a dipole and installing that, you know, from scratch. It's sort of like uh, making an apple pie from scratch. The wire, the coax, making a ballon, just like Gordo pointed out, all the things that go into it. And, of course, soldering coax connectors. And uh, those of you who have seen me on Ham Nation before know that I'm very, very particular about that. So we have a, a soldering class on coax connectors as part of field day. But before we get to the to the dipole and the soldering and before the first cooler is opened up on field day, <laughs> we have a mandatory safety meeting. If you don't attend the safety meeting, you can't operate at field day. And that's so important because we go over all of the items that we're going to use, all of the antennas that we're going to install, all of the plans are uh, laid out step by step 
because, you know, Bob, every year at field day, something bad happens and somebody makes a mistake and does something, quite frankly, stupid. And we want to make sure that everybody has a good time. But that safety meeting is a key issue to making sure that fun stays in field day and we stay out of trouble and don't have any mishaps where anybody gets hurt, ends up at the hospital. Right. And, right. And, you know, every field day, if you think about field days that you've been to, there are memories that are created forever. And Don was talking about that earlier uh, when we were just getting started for the show uh, about the bacon and spelling out the call sign uh, in, in the Sunday morning breakfast <laughs> bacon. And those memories last a lifetime. And, it, and I'm sure that there, it was more than just Dawn that that memory is very vivid and comes back. And so as old time hams, we're out there creating memories for the new hams. And that's so important that we do those things and, 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 and give back. You know, uh, it, what I, we like to do every year is not do the same thing we did the year before. So we change it up, do something different. Um, and that way you attract a whole bunch more activity because there's something new to look forward to. It might be a new antenna. It might be a new radio. Uh, last year we had solar power going for the first time, and that was great. This year we're going to try and have some satellite contacts. You know, the satellite uh, bet is really not hard to get into, and especially somebody in the club that is – already active in satellites, we run a, a nice little class during field day on here's how it works and here's how you get started and how much fun you can have. And that way you expose the club members to more than just, you know, sitting on 20 meters and calling CQ and saying, you know, wow, how many guys can we work? Let's go out and do something different. Um, and then when it's all over, it's real important to get those logs together. You know, you need to appoint somebody to be in charge of log keeping. And whether you do them by hand or you do them on the computer, and we do both. Outside, it's pretty much by hand, the old-fashioned way. So we, we uh, take the pencils out there and uh, the log sheets, just like we did, uh, you know, 30 years ago. And, and then we integrate those into the computer afterwards. But that way, you break down the barriers. It's very easy to write down the call signs. And a lot of times you have a logger and an operator. So you have two operators sitting side by side. And, you know, uh, we've had uh, Terry Kate MNJ on here on Ham Nation when she climbed the tower and she was working pileups. She's got her extra class license. Uh, she's been to several field days, but she's going to come to the W3LIF field day this year to experience this eight echo and, uh -huh. and really dive in head first. So we're very excited. Uh, she's just recently joined the club, and we're very excited that she's going to be a part of it here. But, you know, Bob, you got to take lots of photos, and, and you're right. Have that video yes. camera handy, but also all those iPhones and uh, handheld smartphones that can take photos, and then you put those up on the club website. You talk about something that lasts forever, and, and everybody gets to show off what they did at field day. So uh, I can't emphasize enough this is the number one activity uh around the world you know there's there's field days in europe uh two weeks ago was the european field day and the bands were just full of stations from germany and the united kingdom and italy doing their field day and i it's so much fun over there they have two a year um but we have one big one and boy is it big and uh you know i can't wait till next wednesday when when Dr. T tells us how good the bands are going to be, I mean, that's that's really, you know, uh, we get a little peek into what conditions uh, will be like for the field day weekend. And, you know, I, I think that when it's all said and done and then you, you look in QST a few months after field day is over and you get to relive it all again when you see how well you finished and uh, it gives yes. you something to shoot for. Good. That's Good. great. I, I sure appreciate you coming on and giving us some of those tips, and uh, we look forward to working your group also. And, uh, yeah, hey, I do the old paper log. Isn't that <laughs> awful? I'm, just, I'm sorry. This one happened to be from 1961 and 1962, but that's another story for another day. Now, seriously, Tim, 
this is probably one of the most important things you can do right now. You, you, if you don't have one of these catalogs, you need to you need to get a hold of it because if you receive that and anything they have in here, you're going to hear it in just a little bit. You can have it in, in the next day. So uh, we want to talk about that, and, and we got that coming down the line tonight. But right now we're going to uh, say goodbye to you, Tim. We'll see you on the air. Thanks a lot for coming by. And um, while they get... Uh, get things all set up are you going to turn around and work all kinds of dx from your big station now what happens there <laughs> oh it, you know that's this is a nightly ritual to come down here and, and get one of these icom radios this is the the 20 meter uh station here at k3lr so it's already lit up i got the log up uh we might even turn the amplifier on over here and uh, get on and uh, work some dx check check into the ham nation net here later on but during field day, yeah. will be Whiskey 3, Lima, India, Foxtrot, W3LIF. That's the Mercer County Amateur Radio Club. And so gotcha. uh, we look forward to working you and, and everybody here on Ham Nation uh, as we all okay. have fun with field day. And be safe. Be safe. Yeah. Oh, That's great. the most Thanks, thanks very much for coming by and let us know about what's going on out there. And while Victor gets things uh, searched around here and we get George in here, um, oh, I have another little uh, thing I want to tell everybody that's really important. W when we're doing field day, there are going to be people there that won't have a general license or an advanced extra, any of that. They're going to be technicians and if they show up, they can work the low frequencies. And it's really fun because you can do it uh, with lots of help from all the people around. And we need a logger. So what you want to do is be sure you have two pair of headsets. You're going to have a headset with a microphone on it or a microphone. But you want to have two headsets. You want to have another just headphone and plug them together. And it's real simple. All you need is one of these guys. And you can find this even at Radio Shack, believe it or not, That's or right. anywhere. It's a Y cable. And you, have, you plug this into your phone jack, and then you plug your two headphones into here. And that works great. Now, if you really want to do something, uh, here a few weeks ago on the show, there was a great little project that Randy did of how to build a little mixer. So you can plug in four things into one. Well, you plug that into your phone jack, and then you can plug all the headsets in there and level them. It works great. Of course, the real cool way to do that <laughs> is with one of the new Heil Pro 7s. We have on the side of the Pro 7 an output. It's a monitor jack. And you'll say, what do you need a monitor jack on a headphone for? Just what we're talking about. You take the second headphone, put that on the station that wants to listen, and you take their connector, and you don't have to have Y cords. You plug it right in to the operator's headset, and it works great. So these are some of the things that you want to look at. You still have time to do it, and if you want to get a really cool setup like the Pro 7, Tim Duffy can get it to you the next day. <laughs> Well, let's see if I gave enough time to Victor. And by the way, uh, Victor is uh, uh, sitting in tonight. Uh, uh, Brian is out. I'm not sure. I think he might be water skiing. I, I am not sure. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. Don't start a rumor. And let's see what's going on with ICOM and all of the things that they do. Get out and get mobile. Whether you're looking for a handheld, mobile, or HF rig, ICOM has a radio to get you operating on your next adventure. Take ICOM's IC7100 D-Star radio with you this season. An angled control head and touchscreen provide user-friendly operation. A large internal speaker delivers clear digital audio, and it's perfect for multi-band and all-mode communications. Interested in easy hands-free operation when you hit the road? ICOM's analog IC2730A mobile and the D-Star ID5100A both feature optional Bluetooth capability, a large backlit screen for high contrast viewing, and 50 watts output power on both VHF and UHF. 
So far, with ICOM's D-Star Dual Bander, the ID51A+. Check out the Near Me repeater function for D-Star as well as analog repeaters. Free downloadable RSMS1A Android app plus integrated GPS. Hit the trail with ICOM's IC7410. This HF rig is solid in performance and construction. High-grade DSP, all-mode operation, easy menu and ergonomic dials, and large heat sink for a heavy duty cycle operation. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on ICOM's complete line of amateur radio products. You can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation. Throw your name in the hat for some great swag prizes like T-shirts or caps. And you can also learn how you could possibly win the month of grand prize. And the grand prize for June is going to be the IC2730A, a practical dual band analog dual watch mobile with 50 watts of power on both VHF and UHF, a large easy to see display, optional Bluetooth headset, wide band receive, and a lot more. So go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation after this episode and each episode of Ham Nation and register to win. And now here's Don Wilbanks with a special tribute to Bill Pasternak. Um, it was just last week that I, I told you that I had talked to Bill on Sunday and that uh, he was going to be moved to a, a, another facility. Uh, well, 24 hours later, uh, Bill was gone. Uh, Bill had passed away last Thursday night, about this time. So um, myself and... Mark Abramovich, NT3V, who was on the Young Ham of the Year uh, committee. We got together and we recorded a tribute uh, to Bill. So let's roll that now. From Amateur Radio Newsline, this is a special presentation on the life of Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF. It is with a heavy heart that we report the passing of Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF. Bill was 73. He left us on Thursday evening, June 11th. Up to the end, Bill didn't think about his own condition, but of all of us who came to rely on him for the amateur radio newsline. Newsline was Bill's baby, an on-air bulletin service he co-founded in 1976 as the Westlink Report, and for which he served as managing editor until his death. Bill was a tireless promoter of amateur radio and originated the Young Ham of the Year Award through Newsline, to recognize the accomplishments of young amateurs. He was always behind efforts to promote ham radio among youth and was especially supportive of scouting and its annual jamboree on the air and the operations of K2BSA, the Boy Scouts official station active at national jamborees. For those of you who have listened to Amateur Radio Newsline or watched segments here on Ham Nation prepared by Newsline, you really didn't hear much from the man behind the scenes. Occasionally, he would report on breaking news stories from the Amateur Radio Newsline studios in California, but he always preferred to get his staff of reporters on the air, doing the job for you. Bill was an intrepid behind-the-scenes newsman pursuing leads weekly for Newsline and recruiting an all-volunteer staff made up of active and retired broadcasters and others to help produce the program. Bill was a published author and wrote for a variety of publications, including CQ, QST, 73, and World Radio, to name a few. Bill was among those behind the American Radio Relay League's entry into promoting the hobby through a popular series of films and videos that circulated among radio clubs throughout the nation and around the world over the years. He worked with his close friends, Dave Bell, W6AQ, his longtime friend and TV producer, and Roy Neal, K6DUE, former NBC News science editor. Bill's last project for the ARRL was with Dave Bell and a video targeting the DIY and makers whom he believed could offer much to amateur radio's ranks. Bill always wanted his videos to be an out-of-this-world experience for the viewer, as in space, of course, where he believed ham radio should play a role. One of his crowning achievements came when he included in an ARRL video the first contacts with the first ham radio astronaut in space, Owen Garriott, W5LFL, in 1983. 
Bill's last video, released a few years ago, also featured an appearance by an astronaut aboard the International Space Station, astronaut Doug Wheelock, KF5BOC. It also included a video of a follow-up eyeball at Dayton between the astronaut and one of the people with whom he had a QSO while in space. Bill Pasternak was a native of Brooklyn, New York, and was first licensed there in 1959 as WA2HVK. You could take the boy out of New York, but if you listen closely, you couldn't take the accent out of the boy. Bill loved talking about his exploits on six meters in New York in his early days. And he also fondly recalled getting his private pilot's license back then and flying and operating Aeromobile in New Jersey. When the no-co technician license arrived, Bill convinced the love of his life, Sharon, to take the test. She became KD6EPW. Bill not only embraced technology as a hobby, but as a vocation as well. He found his way into television as an engineer and worked for several years at KTTV, which became the Fox station in Los Angeles. Bill retired in 2012 and continued to serve as broadcast consultant and devoted more of his time to the amateur radio newsline. Besides amateur radio, Bill loved Broadway theater, and he was an avid theatergoer. He made regular trips to New York to see musicals and drama productions and took in shows when they hit the West Coast as well. Many don't know, but he made many friends among actors and actresses over the years, true friends like those he had in amateur radio. Bill's the only ham to be recognized twice by the Dayton Hamvention Group. He received the Special Achievement Award in 1981 and the Radio Amateur of the Year Award in 1989. Bill was also recognized by the ARRL with a National Certificate of Merit for his contributions to promoting amateur radio and also served on the Public Relations Committee at headquarters. We are sad he has left us. But we are happy Bill is at peace and has gone to the best DX location one could ever imagine. A memorial service is being planned, and in lieu of flowers, family is asking for contributions to the Amateur Radio Newsline to continue the Young Ham of the Year Award in Bill's name. On a personal level, as chairman of the Young Ham of the Year Award Judging Committee, I can promise you the award will be made this year. It's a promise I made to Bill just a few days ago in a brief and final telephone conversation with a friend, a true friend whom I will miss very much. I met Bill in 2002. Wow, that's almost 17 years ago, when my son Josh, then KB3GWI, was selected as the Young Ham of the Year. It was at the Huntsville Ham Fest, and my wife Sue, NZ3G, and daughter Amy, KB3IJW, flew down to attend the event. Bill was gracious and kind, and my family and I forged an instant bond with him. Because of my professional work as a broadcaster in Philadelphia, Bill asked me to join the fine stable of contributors to Amateur Radio Newsline. I graciously accepted. When the chairman of the Young Ham of the Year Award Committee wanted to give it up, Bill came right to me. He said because of my scouting background and interest in exposing young people to ham radio, I'd be a perfect fit. How could I say no? But now... He has left us. We all grieve in different ways, but as a man of faith, I'd like to say to all of you, Bill was a man of great faith. He is now at peace. He is enjoying his heavenly reward. He gave his very best to all of us. The best way we can continue his legacy is to carry the spirit, that spark of curiosity, and the light of knowledge through this wonderful world of amateur radio. I'm Mark Abramovich. NT3V. Thank you, Mark. I met Bill in 1995, 20 years ago now, through Kevin Boudreau, N5XMH, the 1993 Young Ham of the Year. He and I traveled to the Huntsville Ham Fest together. I'd only been a ham eight months, and with my broadcasting career, I was immediately thrust into Amateur Radio Newsline. Bill had a way of making you an offer you couldn't refuse. Well, in those two decades, he became more than a friend and a colleague. He became an uncle. He became an older brother, a teacher, and a mentor. As noted voiceover talent Bo Weaver, W6KHJ, is fond of saying, Bill has taken his light into another room. Or to put it in ham radio terms, he's moved on up the band to a spot where we don't yet have privileges. But we will one day, and Bill will be the first to answer our call. The saying, who's going to fill their shoes, comes to mind, but I don't think it really applies here. 
because only Bill Pasternak could wear those shoes. But we in the Amateur Radio Newsline, and you who listen, watch, and support what we do, can stand together in his footprints and take the next steps together. We'll lock arms, and we'll move forward, and we'll do it together. Because Bill would want that, and because it's the right thing to do. More in future reports. For everyone associated with the Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW. Thank you. Yeah, Bill. Uh, Bill's a tough act to follow, that's for sure. And and he touched everyone who who knew him. I mean, he just just he immediately just jumped into your soul and and stayed there and will stay there for the rest of of our lives. That's for sure. Uh, you heard how Mark Abramovich NT3V met Bill, and you heard how I met Bill. I got an email today from uh, Alan Glasser, who is a ham. Uh, his call is NY2G, and he lives in Brooklyn, where Bill is from. I'd like to read this to you, because this is, this is very cool. Alan, thank you for sending this. Dear Don, I hope this email finds you before the show tonight. I know and understand your relationship with Bill Pasternak. Please accept my condolences for the loss of a dear friend. Here's a quick story about Bill and how I got interested in ham radio and held my first ham radio microphone in my hand. It was Bill's. That was way back in 1959 or 1960-ish. I was born in 48, so my age and the story buried in my memory seems right. I lived and still live on 68, uh, 66th Street between Bay Parkway and 21st Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. The TV repair shop Bill was talking about in his online bio, you'll find that on the Newsline website, was on Bay Parkway between 66th Street and 67th. I hung out with the old man with a cane. Perhaps he has polio or just needed a cane. I was too young to understand, but remember helping him move things in the store. I watched the old man service and repair black and white TV sets and marveled at the test equipment that he used. One piece of equipment was a giant magnifying glass. I assumed he used it to focus the picture tube. So one day, this guy's parked outside the TV repair shop on Bay Parkway, and he's explaining about amateur radio and talking to someone from some sort of a box near the passenger seat near the floor. This guy was trying to explain to me about his halo antenna on the back of his car. I can't remember if, it, if he said two meters or six meters, which I wouldn't have known about anyway. This guy hands me a microphone and says, want to speak to my friend? Hello? What else does a 10 or 11-year-old kid know what to say? There was some sort of a conversation, but who remembers? Nevertheless, I was bit by the bug. I'm 99% sure that was Bill Pasternak and his car. Well, the old man in the TV shop died. Bill Pasternak moved away. And my next encounter with ham radio was as a camp or with a camp counselor at Monroe Sleepaway Summer Camp in upstate New York. I did the CB thing in high school. Eventually, I got my license in 1984. Thank you, Bill, for turning me on. And may the ether keep your signals forever strong. Alan NY2G, Brooklyn, New York. And those stories are commonplace when you talk about the legend of Bill Pasternak. And he truly was a legend in his own time and will remain so. So he's uh, going to be a tough act to follow. So um, hopefully we'll have a Newsline report for you next week. And hopefully we'll have a solar report for you next week as well with Dr. T, as Tim Duffy uh, said. But first, uh, I'd like to just take a a brief moment of silence, uh, if we can, um, and say a final 7-3 and talk to you later to Bill, if we might. He was a good man. Thank you. Uh, let's let's go to a smoke and solder now. You know, George uh, Thomas has a lot of solder and he's going to be doing field day. And I, I th George brings the solder and I've been I've been getting my field day supplies together here as well. And if George brings a solder. I'll bring the smoke. Let's go check out smoke and solder. <laughs> For the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about balance. As a matter of fact, last week we built a one-to-one -one ballon. This week we're going to build a four-to-one. It's a very similar construction process, but there are a few things that are different. We're using essentially the same materials for the four-to-one ballon with a couple of additions. First, we're using two toroids here. We'll still use 2.4 inch ones, number 31 mix this time around. We're still going to use the same high temperature insulated magnet wire as we used before. However, this time we're going to cover it in Teflon insulation. The original one-to-one -one ballon we made, we had the two wires side by side. That gave us a 50 ohm transmission line, which we wrapped around a toroid. By adding the Teflon insulation around the wire, we're increasing the spacing, making this a 100 ohm transmission line.
So we'll need to wind two 100-ohm transmission lines, one around each of the toroids. Now look at last week's episode on the information for the one-to-one ballon as much of it will apply to this episode. As before, I have a chart here that's showing how many turns we're going to need. I'm going to build a 3 to 10 megahertz ballon, so we'll need 13 bifiller turns of sleeved number 14 wire on each of the toroids. So I prepared my wire in advance by scraping off the insulation and tinning it because it would be easier to do it when it's free like this. We'll slide the Teflon insulation over it now. We'll need to tape these two lines together every one and a half inches using some of the glass fiber tape like we used last week. At one end of the windings here, we'll actually need to tape the wire itself to the tubing so that it doesn't slide in and out as we're working with it. And as before, we want to keep these as straight and parallel as possible. Now we've got both of our transmission lines ready to go here. We're going to wind the first toroid, leaving about an inch and a half free on one end. And we're going to try to space these as tightly as we can. I'll put a tie wrap around the first end now to keep it from sliding. I've got both of the toroids wound. It's time to do some identification of the leads. We'll just take one in here and we'll mark it as one. We'll find the other end of that particular wire. We'll mark that two. And then back over here where we began, we'll mark the opposite wire three. And then there's only one end left. We'll mark that four. Now on the other toroid, we'll pick up with number five. We'll find the other end of that wire. That'll be number six. And then back on the end we began with. Number seven. And then the last wire, number eight. We've got to connect all this together and stuff it in this box. So I'm going to begin, and I may end up redoing this, but I'm going to tie wrap the two toroids together, one on top of the other. Wires number one and five need to be connected together and go to the ground terminal of the SO239. Wires 3 and 7 are connected together and connect to the center pin here of the SO239. This is going to take a little experimenting to pull off. Now I've contorted those two around to where they will probably fit. Now we need to try to make the other wires reach. For wires number 4 and 6, I clipped them off and solder them together right here to put the tubes in series. You could insulate that with something. Where it'll be positioned in here, it's not going to touch anything, so I'll just leave it alone. Then you bend all the other wires like this. Now, how do you know where to bend all these other wires? Well, it took a lot of fiddling around inside this box here to figure that out, but everything should be pretty close to the right positions now. What I'm going to have to do is shove this in the box, make all the connections, and solder everything together. Since my screws are going in from the inside here for my terminals for the antenna, I decided it's probably best to go ahead and put my crimp lugs in there now because I won't be able to get a screwdriver in there later. So let's see if we can get everything to fit. You know, this is probably actually going to work. Now, you can see that I'm not going to be able to get my crimpers in there. I left the screw unscrewed a little bit. That's because I don't want to melt my plastic box here when I'm trying to solder on this connector. So we'll pull it back a little bit, best we can. Now, we'll flow some solder down in here to make that connection. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is connect the SO239 here. You can see I've got the one lug there. That's kind of bent up looking. See if I can flatten it. It's going to go under the ground lug, but first I want to put a washer under there. Then we'll fit the terminal through. Another washer. A lock washer. And then the nut. And that's good enough for temporary. We can see that our center pin lined up perfectly with the wire we intended to solder into it. So we'll just solder that now. 
Now we've got the SO239 about complete. We'll want to come back and tighten up that screw and nut right there, but we'll leave it for the time being. We've only really got one connection left, and that's the one going to the opposite side of the antenna here. So we'll just bend our lead where it'll fit in that terminal. That looks good, and I'll just put my pliers behind there to kind of hold the terminal off the plastic because I don't really want to melt the plastic. And now let's see if we can flow some solder down in there. All our connections are made. Now it's just a matter of tightening up everything. I'll do the SO239 first. We'll get that good and tight because if that ever gets loose, we're going to have a real problem. But I think we can get it tight enough, and especially with the lock washer on there. Might be wondering, how in the world are you going to get a screwdriver down in there? Well, I thought about that, and fortunately I came up with a solution. What I'm doing here is when I drill the hole for the screw, it is so tight that the screw actually cut threads into the plastic here. That's good because I wanted that, and to kind of help make it watertight as well. But how do you tighten it up? Well, I took two nuts and I stuck out here on the end of the screw. And now we'll just take a wrench and we'll use the wrench to tighten the screw up with. And that feels like it. It's good and tight. So what I'll need to do now is take off the outer nut and then just screw the inner nut on down. And now we'll just do the same thing on the other side. And there we go, and we'll just kind of move the ballon around to where it's kind of centered in there, and nothing's really touching that shouldn't. And now we've got two more eye bolts that we'll screw in through the sides here and put nuts on. These two, our antenna leads from our dipole, will actually tie around, and that'll kind of stress relief them, and the end can just loop on down and connect under the wing nut. Now these I drilled with a smaller bit so the eye bolt would actually cut threads into the case. There's two reasons I did that. One is to act as a second nut so when I put the nut in there it'll, it'll be held tight into place. And the other is to try to keep water from leaking around there. But there's another thing I'm going to do to try to keep the water out. I'm going to use a little bit of one of my favorite glues here. It's 3M Super Weather Strip Adhesive. I'm just going to put a little around the thread to the eye bolt. And we'll screw it on down, and hopefully a little of that is going into the threads and giving us a watertight seal. So there we go. One complete 4-to-1 ballon. Heavy duty. All we need to do now is put the case on and check her out. Also, one thing you didn't see me do on this ballon, or the last one I built, is I'll use some of that 3M weather strip adhesive up under the SO239 here to act as a water seal on it as well. I want to thank Joe Zaleski, KC8LC, for providing the materials and the research to make this project possible. And Joe pointed out two resources that he likes that you should probably know about. The first is the book Reflections 3 by Walt Maxwell, W2DU. It was printed by CQ Communications, and it's got an excellent explanation of common mode current in Chapter 21. Also, K9YC has written many articles and done videos on the subject of controlling RF and RFI. He builds on Walt Maxwell's writings and presents the kind of information every ham should be aware of. Let's our uh, talk about balance. Three weeks now, the first one we talked about them and why you might want one. Last week, we built a four-to-one, or excuse me, we built a one-to-one. -one. This week, I built a four-to-one. It They look the same, but, you know, I've been using the Ugly Ballon, the coax wrapped around a piece of PVC like Gordo showed us earlier. I've had that out on my 80-meter loop here for several years, and I've always had an RFI problem here in the uh, shack and the reflected power was running a little higher than I thought it should. The loop was resonant right there, according to my uh, antenna analyzer, but still uh, not as low as SWR as it should be, an RFI problem. Well, I took my ugly ballon out and I hung that one-to-one -one in there this past week. Man, what a difference. I mean, it's, um, 
I could operate all of 80 meters now without a tuner. It's it's that broadbanded and absolutely no RFI here in the shack anymore. So really a worthwhile project. You know, they say for an 80-meter loop, you can just feed it with coax. You really don't need a ballon, but yeah, uh, I think you probably do. It, it made a big difference here. So uh, thanks to Joe for providing the materials, the inspiration, and the instructions on how to put all that together. You should try one yourself. It's really a lot of fun, and uh, boy, just just a nice project. You always need a four-to-one. This one's probably going to go to field day with me this year. You know, speaking of field day, several years ago, uh, my friends uh, Tommy and Jim, you remember my friend Jim with the torch, we went way out in the woods and I uh, cleared out an area and did field day out there. Well, that's what Tommy and I and our friend Wayne are going to do this year. As a matter of fact, Tommy and I went out to the woods yesterday and cleared out an area, got it ready to go. So when we go back uh, next Saturday morning, we can just concentrate on uh, setting up for field day. You know, most people uh, try to do it around town or somewhere and uh, hang up a sign and get some publicity for amateur radio, but... I don't know. We we kind of like to go off the grid and way away from civilization and do hours, and uh, it, it's always a lot of fun. So I encourage you, go out and, and do field day this year. Yeah, it's probably hot. It's definitely hot down here, but uh, so much fun you can have. We just thoroughly enjoy it. Now, you might notice one other thing behind me here. This is a scope squid, and you might ask, what is a scope squid? Well, another name for it is an octopus, and uh, our friend Mike, VE3MIC there in the chat room, got the parts together for this and uh, the schematic and sent it to me, and I built that and put it together in the most recent episode of Amateur Logic that we just released this weekend. Go check that out. You add this thing with this digital scope I've got behind me now, and you'll be amazed at what you can see with it. As far as a component tester, it really clarifies a, a lot of things about electronics that, um, well, you just got to see it to, to fully appreciate it. So go check that out over at amateurlogic.tv. Now, I've got something I want to give away here. It's these headphones. You know, last week when uh, Joe Walsh was visiting with us, I had this set of Heil uh, Pro Set 3s here that uh, Heil Sound has donated, of course. And I asked a question, and that is to connect a 200-ohm balanced antenna to a 50-ohm transmission line, what ratio of ballon would you need? And we got an answer on that. As a matter of fact, we got a lot of answers. But the one that's going to win is David Hold KE5ZZO. And he said it's a four to one. So congratulations, David. We're going to send this set of Heil Pro Set 3s out to you this week. You are going to thoroughly enjoy them, and you'll have them in time for field day. And this is what I use on field day. Um, I don't know. I just like them. I don't have a you know headset with the boom on it. So I just use a hand mic and a pair of these right here. Works great. Now for next week, we've got another prize here we're going to give away. This is an excellent book. It's from Drew Diamond, VK3XU, and the book comes from MFJ Publishing. It's QRP Projects from Down Under. He's got a lot of great projects in here. If you've been watching Smoke and Solder on Ham Nation for a long time, you might remember me soldering aluminum one time. Yes, that, that's right. I said soldering aluminum. This is where I got the tip from on how to do it. So a great book. If you'd like to win that, well, then answer this question for me. Why did we use Teflon sleeving on the 4-to-1 ballon that I built this week, but we didn't use it on the 1-to-1 ballon that I built last week? If you think you know the answer to that, send it to me at hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and uh, you could win QRP projects from down under. Well, now let's get on back in with Bob. I know we've got some more field day to talk about here, Bob. So uh, back to you, my friend. Well, I want to bring in my great friend and family from Nashville, 
And if, if you don't know about these people, uh, you will. These are fabulous people. We're going to have them on in a couple of weeks. Let's see if Ted is there. Ted Randall, are you and your family there from Nashville? We are here. They are. Yeah. And uh, we're all getting ready for field day. I, I like the hat. How do I get one of those? Well, you, no, you got to have a hat. Anyways, so. Wear a hat, so you better take a good look, everybody, because you won't find me in any other kind of hat. But anyway, why we have you on tonight is that uh, you guys run, and gals, you run a 100,000-watt station. However, it's not on ham radio. First of all, I want you to introduce each of your, uh, your children, and I want you to then tell us a little bit about this uh, wonderful transmitter you got and why we want you to uh, be on tonight so we can all talk through that baby. Well, we've got David over here in the corner. David, raise hand or say something. Call sign. I guess I'll have to KG4WXW. Of course, myself, WB8POM, Holly, who is my wife, and uh, she is waving there, KG4WXV, and then the other son, the troublemaker, uh, KG4WXX, that's uh, Matt. So we're all here. And uh, what we do every, every year, we broadcast Field Day Live, and you say, well, how do you do that? Well, we have people calling in from all over the country talking about their field day uh, exercise and what they're doing, what they're eating, uh, how many, what, what class they're running. And a lot of times they pass the cell phone around to different people at the different parts of their field day operation. And those folks share with us what they're, what they're doing and how much fun they're having and uh, tell a little bit. And I mean, we've had, we've had a, a field day location that had a little kid that was like six years old, seven years old, that had a ticket all the way up to someone that was like a hundred uh, still participating in field day. Now, the reason why we do this is we want to take the message of amateur radio and field day itself, what magic there is. We want to take it to the whole world. And, of course, there's millions of people listening to shortwave around the world. So this really gives them a chance to hear what we're doing and what it's all about and fulfilling that part of Part 97 that says that part of what we do as hams is to enhance international goodwill. And I think this really, really does because we have, it just shows how much fun Field Day is. Well, we appreciate what you do there. And uh, everybody needs to really take a listen uh, to, the, to you, all the programs that you do. Tell us the frequency and some of the things that you do uh, on, the, on the transmitter. And I think you've got a little short video. I wonder if that will run. We've never tried this. Let's find out while you tell us those phone numbers and things like that. You let everybody see this monster that's down in the Nashville area. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, let's take a peek at what a shortwave station actually looks like. This is WTWW, and we're passing transmitter two, like uh, like on a, on, a, on a little airplane. <laughs> we're going by transmitter one now. These are continental transmitters, and uh, they run the full 100,000 watts. And this one over here is a Harris. It's also a 100,000-watt transmitter. And, of course, there's a big antenna farm that we really can't show uh, very well on, uh, on, on over, over television, but uh, it's, it's big, takes up acres. And, of course, it, it, it covers the globe. On Saturdays, we have QSO, which I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with. That runs at 1 o'clock uh, in the afternoon, Central Daylight Time on 9475. Then on Saturday nights and Sunday nights is when we have a lot of fun. We play music, and uh, we play a combination of whatever people call in and ask for. And this is a good opportunity also for amateur radio clubs, organizations, whatever you got, to send us information on what you're doing. If you want us to make an announcement over shortwave, that's a, a, a great way to get the word out to shortwave listeners in your area and hams in your area that uh, may want to participate in whatever it is that you're doing. Um, the telephone number to call for the field day broadcast, and we would love for everybody at every location to call in and talk to us is 615-813-0173. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's on our website, qsoradioshow.com. And uh, we really appreciate the call in. We love to hear from folks. 
Well, we want to we want to make sure that everybody that's listening to us, all of you guys and gals that are going to be out on your field day sites for your club or uh, whatever, call in and let people know. And we're talking about people around the world, people that are not amateur radio operators. Let them know how much fun you're having. And we don't patch in the audio or any of that from your receiver. We just want you to say hey, I'm out here and we're doing this and how many people you have and maybe a little short uh, synopsis of how you got into it and all that kind of good stuff. Well, this is really great and uh, the video came out very well and I... Uh, I want to see if uh, we can get some time here in a few weeks and we'll, uh, we'll have you all on and, and talk about just exactly what's going on there because I know that you've done a lot of good to keep shortwave radio because uh, I find a lot of people, uh, they think a shortwave is gone and all that. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's incredible how much is happening in a shortwave. How many transmitters well, do you have in support there? Well, right now we have three that's on the air. We actually have two more. <laughs> we haven't hooked up yet. <laughs> so uh, we may have to have a transmitter raising party here one of these days. If uh, folks come to the area, if they'd like to see the station, just contact us. We'd love to, we'd love to, to show it off. And the other thing is, is that you were asking about listeners, Saturday nights and Sunday nights, we do music. And um, okay. it's rare to hear music on shortwave, but we'll get anywhere from 600, maybe even as much as 700 emails in the first hour we're on of course they're from everywhere but people just love listening to oldies and they like listening to old country and different things and that's what we do and we'll play anything whatever they ask for if they want to hear perry como frank sinatra it doesn't matter so but we, we appreciate you putting us on uh, uh bob i think that uh th this is a, a grand thing and of course we're all trying to promote this hobby of ham radio that's what this is all about and taking the story and the sounds of field day. Now, we don't broadcast anyone's QSOs. We just get people on the phone telling us about their locations. And believe me, it's, it's grand entertainment when these folks are all excited and start telling about what they're doing. And they pass the cell phone around. And uh, they have city officials that will get on the air with us. It's just really cool. Well, we really appreciate you being here. And I thank my wife, Sarah, because she's the one that found all of you back in the corner of our ham radio reception. I don't know, what was it, six or eight years ago? And said, you got to go back and meet that family. And we've been friends ever since doing some really neat things. And uh, I applaud all of you because you do a lot for the broadcast industry as well as amateur radio. So we'll see you in a, in a what, about 10 days, whatever. Let's all call in and... Uh, uh, see what's uh, happening on the shortwave band, everybody. So please do that. And uh, greetings to all of you down there in Nashville. And uh, uh, you guys all and gals all take care. And we'll we'll see you next time. And so long for now. Okay. Seventy three. We we really appreciate these these, uh, these people that give so much of their life. Here's another one. We're going to go down to uh, New Orleans and talk to Nick Tusa. Nick, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm here. How are you doing? Hey, we're doing good. K5EF. And Nick is, um, he's just an all around uh, uh, amateur radio uh, fan that started when he was very young with the Central Electronics Company. And of course, today he's got quite a company of his own taking care of all kinds of commercial radios. But why we brought him on here for a few minutes, you remember a couple of years ago, I was all thrilled about getting to meet <coughs> Wes Shum and spend weekend of field day at West Shum's farm. Well, it's Nick that put it together. And Nick, I understand we're going to do it again on this field day. Tell us a little about that. Well, yes, we, we are. Unfortunately, last year we couldn't do it. Um, uh, Diane and John vote, um, uh, Wes's, uh, uh, daughter and son-in-law had inadvertently, <laughs> I don't know how they did this, but inadvertently had scheduled a wedding on field day weekend. So uh, we got uh, washed out, so to speak, on field day last year. But um, this year we'll be back out at, at uh, W9DYV's QTH in uh, Jonesboro, Tennessee. And uh, we'll be operating again with um, Central Electronics 200V, 600L, uh, Collin 75A4, and a whole host of antennas um, and uh, we're so pleased uh, that you will be able to join us uh, again. And um, 
Uh, we're anticipating we'll, we'll also have a few uh, special events that occur, just like last year when the power supply in the 200V exploded and uh, <laughs> had to be uh, uh, repaired under the uh, uh, tarpaulin and, and uh, shade trees by the little pond. But that's all <laughs> about what field day is, and, and it's the unexpected. Uh, but the fun thing is is that uh, we'll be util utilizing uh, vintage radio equipment, and uh, guys that maybe don't hear these sets on very much will get a chance to hear them on, uh, on uh, Saturday and Sunday. We'll be operating from uh, 14260 to about 14293, which is the uh, traditional uh, frequencies where uh, either the Collins – collectors hang out or also the uh, vintage sideband guys and uh, the Hallicrafters and, and the Heath Kitnet. So hopefully we'll have uh, a lot of guys uh, come in and, and talk to us. And, and uh, we're certainly looking forward to having you on the mic, Bob. Well, it's just such a great event. And uh, uh, you have to understand that this is happening at, at West Shum's farm. West Shum is the guy that brought single sideband to ham radio. And we had a show a couple of years ago. Go back and look at it. It was really great about the history of single sideband and, of course, what Wes brought to the uh, to the the whole fraternity. It was really great that I got to meet him because I built that 20A behind me, and it was my college education. You've heard me talk about it before. For you, for all of you that uh, get electric radio. There's a, a whole page in here about the operation and what's going to happen, and you want to check that out. But uh, can they go to your site, uh, Nick? Where can they find out uh, a little bit more information? Uh, well, one of two things. They can um, certainly uh, go to the CE um, uh, Central Electronics website, and there's a uh, email link there that also goes to my business email. Or they can simply call me on my cell phone. That's probably... Right now, if they're interested in coming out, that would probably be the quickest and easiest way. And uh, I don't mind giving that number out. And it's a nice, easy one for all the hams to remember. 504-400-8873. Uh, that's great. Well, <laughs> we, uh, we want to try to get as many. Everybody's welcome to come. And if you've never operated some vintage radios, this is your chance, but not just a chance. It's a chance with the man that brought single sideband to amateur radio. Uh, how old is, is uh, Wes now, Nick? Wes will be 94 years old um, this uh, December 7th. And um, he's still in good health and um, he's spry. And I expect him to be out there under uh, uh, the top hole with with his uh, 200V and uh, saying hello to a bunch of the guys out on uh, uh, 14293. <laughs> well, we had such a great time there last year. I'm looking forward to it. And Diane's got my room reserved, and that's the whole deal. Please uh, join us, everybody. This is really great. And it's out in uh, East Tennessee, Jonesboro, Tennessee. Give that phone number one more time, please, Nick. Okay, it's 504-400-8873. All right. Well, we thank you for being here, and I look forward to seeing uh, you and a lot of the vintage guys down there, and we'll uh, make it all happen for Field Day once again. Thanks a lot for being here. I appreciate it. Well, we, Thanks, we talked a while great. ago. Yeah. We talked a while ago about the importance of having one of these. And let's see, Don, are you still aboard with us that you can talk even more about DX engineering? 10-4, Commodore. Let's do it. Are you ready for field day? I bet you are. I'm, I'm, I'm getting it. This is, you cannot get these at DX Engineering. So you're on your own for this. <laughs> but what they do have there, they do have wire antennas. And let me tell you something. You can smoke the band with a wire antenna. You got to get all your supplies and gear and make sure your club's event is going to go off without a hitch. Take some time to check out the new DX Engineering catalog. Check out the new products to help make Field Day fun and enjoyable for everybody. I, I mentioned wire antennas. They're a great choice for Field Day because they're compact. 
They're really easy to deploy, and they offer exceptional performance. The thing I've always said about a wire antenna is, you know, with a Yagi or, or something like that, uh, you know, it's got to be put up kind of just right. Well, with a wire antenna, it doesn't have to be put up right. It just has to be put up. And that's the beauty about a wire antenna, any kind of an emergency antenna. Wire antenna makes a great one. And DX Engineering carries several wire antennas from MFJ. Visit DX Engineering. Check out the entire selection. They're online, dxengineering.com. Over a dozen to choose from. Virtually every HF band, including six from MFJ, and most of the wire antennas will handle full legal limit, or the, the full gallon, as we say. Gives you the uh, best chance to make your contacts all weekend. They're durable enough to withstand the rigors of a yearly field day setup and teardown, too. Uh, you want a hassle-free way to hang your wire antenna real quick? You got to check out Easy Hang. These things are amazing. It's a modern spin on the familiar slingshot design. It's a fishing reel married to a slingshot with a tennis ball attached to the line. Pull back on the band, let the rope fly. The kits will speed up your field day setup and make sure you maximize your performance by installing the antenna at its optimum height. And believe me, it works so much better than tying a string to a pickle jar. <laughs> Just ask N5SC at the Westside Amateur Radio Club. Yeah, I was there when that happened. Scary stuff. Two Easy Hang Kit versions are available depending on your application. Make sure you check your local laws regarding slingshots before you buy. That's important because in some states they're considered weapons. Now, once you've set up your field day antennas, make sure they're working at their full potential. The Rig Expert Antenna Analyzer is the deal for testing, checking, tuning, repairing antennas and feed lines. You can also check uh, coax assemblies. They measure capacitance or inductance. Of reactive loads, they dramatically cut down on antenna adjustment time. Get you on the air fast. Simple battery-powered operation. Large display makes them easy to use out in the field. Graphic representation of SWR, impedance loss, and more. Several to choose from, depending on what frequency range you want to cover. Check it out. It's in the catalog. There's even a model that has 0.1 to 1,400 megahertz range. That'll cover about everything, won't it? Yep. DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. Get your order in by 10 p.m. Eastern tonight. If it's in stock, it'll be on a truck headed your way. Tonight, not tomorrow, not four or five days from now when they get around to it. No, tonight, if it's in stock, Proven Products Expert Advice DX Engineering truly helps you shrink the globe. Request your catalog shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. DX Engineering, thank you so much for your support of this little thing we call Ham Nation. About time to check in on the chat room now with Amanda. And Amanda, you know, they were talking about WTWW and the shortwave station. I have... Direct experience with shortwave. When I worked as a disc jockey on WRNO New Orleans on the FM uh, back in the early 80s, in the middle of the Cold War, the Reagan era, we put rock and roll FM on shortwave on WRNO Worldwide. And when that thing was simulcasting, we had an 800 number for a request line, and there was no telling who was going to be on the end of that when it came on. Just an amazing experience. So you need to, if you're in Nashville, go check out uh, Ted and WTWW because shortwave is a whole nother animal. Amanda, what's going on in the chat room tonight? Oh, there's so much going on in the chat room. By the way, I'm you. ready for field day. I am Look ready. You. you got your cigars? Um, you got your cigars? He's, yeah, he's got them right here. Uh, Good for him. I said no lighting them in the ham shack. It's uh, this no, private joke, you guys. Um, no, really. Uh, and we need to talk about that uh, shortwave listening. I have a friend that's big into it and the, the DX part of it. So we'll get into that another episode. But let's move on because we got a lot to go over in a very short amount of time. So first announcement, Christian K0STH is still looking for some new or old ham stories. So you guys look him up on QRZ and email him and story, your stories right away way. Uh, Christian would really appreciate that. If you want to be on Ham Nation, you better do it. All right. Next um, announcement. Before field day, if you want to test out those new dipole antennas and uh, work on those balance that you just built by looking at George's tutorials there, please, please get on the air and work this special event station W1K. It's the Lost Pine Scout Reservation in Bastrop, Texas, if I said that right, if I said it wrong, I apologize. Uh, they're going to be on 20 meters today uh, on Friday and between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time. So test out your new uh, setups for field day. They'd love to work you. Um, other than that, I do have a couple questions. So first question would be logging software. Um, Don, do you use any special logging software for field day? He's lighting a cigar. Okay, I stepped well, away I can... for a moment. I'm getting ready for field day. 
I get my you, chapeau. You look like What's you're ready for a Blues Brothers contest. Uh, okay. Uh, this, um, this is... This is this is my uh, Indiana Jones hat. But anyway, what's the question? I, I'm sorry, I stepped away. Do no, that's fine. Do you use any special logging software for field day? We really need Val for this question, but I'm gonna stop yeah. to you. I tell you something I discovered a long time ago. A guy named N3FJP, I believe is his call sign, or FPJ, one of the two. Uh, he's been doing uh, logging software for all kind of contests forever and i love his uh, field day logger n3 fjp or fpj one of the two so uh, google it up and, and and check it out that's that's who i've used forever fjp i got the uh, signal here it is n3 fjp by the way if you actually work him on field day and you're typing it into his logging software it's pretty cool because it pops up with this box bling make sure you say oh, hello and thank you for the software so that's neat i i've I recommend it as well. We use it for field day, and I think it works fantastic because you can network it between all of your stations. Right. Good now, stuff. let's move on to uh, working some stations. Bob mentioned some great ideas about making sure you get it known out into your area that you're having your field day. Not only that, but make sure you have someone there to greet the visitors that are going to come. Uh, you need to designate someone. It's very important. Otherwise, you're all buried into your radios and you've got your headphones on and you're trying to make contacts and you don't realize people might be mulling around wondering what you're doing. So make sure you have someone designated there. And another pointer I got just last night from one of our CW ops is do not mull around behind the CW operators during field day for a long amount of time. They're trying to hear, trying to break through pileups, and um, it can be very frustrating with a long going conversation right behind them. So make sure you show the visitors how the Morse code is working and uh, let them listen to it a little bit, but make them just move off about 10, 15 feet. Give them a little bit of breathing room there. Otherwise you might see somebody go off the handle. Um, just my opinion, but hey, Bob, uh, again, another big yep. field day operator. Looking forward to uh, maybe working you guys on the air as well. What do you think? Does anyone um, actually work 160 meters during field day? Is it worth putting up an antenna for? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and there, there's no question. There's, there are people there because it, it's not that difficult to put up, especially on field day. You're out where there's a lot of trees and stuff. So it's really quite easy to put up a 250-foot dipole, 125 each side. And and you might get some extra points because it's going to be another band for you. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people there. And I'm ready. I got all my bug sprays and stuff. And uh, our uh, our custom department at Heil Sound built me this, yes, this special oh, microphone. Nice. It's a, right. Check it out. I mean, check it out. We're that ready. That is cool. I mean, Working you, field you day, you might as well <laughs> have a microphone for it. But, oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, we'll be there on field day, and I, I guess we'll hear you. Did you see what you did to uh, to <laughs> WB6NOA's receiver on six meters? Did you see that earlier? Mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. did, and I think he said something about how he wished he had had his seatbelt on while he was operating. Oh, my gosh, that was, signal was awesome. I had such a fun time running VHF contests this last weekend. It was it was a blast. We got some major pileups to California. Other than that, the band really sucked the whole weekend, but that was that was a blast. Uh, the coolest thing was here in Gordo. Okay. Your signal was smoking, darling. It, it was, but you know what? Okay, I'll tell you about the station a little bit. We're running an alpha amp on, um, it was a 1.1 1 .1, uh, kilowatts there. And uh, a two, we had two five element beams up there in the air. Um, you know, and with the rotator, you know, all that. It was, a, it was a fun, fun time. We had a, but again, not the best band conditions, but still a fun time with the whole group of RM Ham. Really enjoyed hanging out with those guys. You, you have um, you have a couple of more. We're going to have one more minute. What you got left? Okay, one more minute. Uh, George is not here. Oh, yes, he is here. George, we got one for you. George, what? Um, where did you get the tool to hold your project and your printed circuit boards while you're working on them? Love the hat, um, by the way. I'm not sure what uh, tools we were talking about there. Uh, it may have been the Panavice. Uh, that's this... 
right behind me here. I, I can't reach it from here. Or it might have been the little thing with the alligator clips on it. Those are called helping hands. Uh, just just do a search for either one of those on Google. You can come up with them. By the way, I'm ready for field day here. Not only do I have my stylish hat here, I've got my welding goggles just in case there's any major catastrophes, I'll be ready. Don't you lie. Those are your what? wife's sunglasses. Don't, don't oh, lie to us. Yeah. Those are your <laughs> wife. She stole those out of her purse. <laughs> well, this <laughs> Talking about field day, getting ready for it. And uh, I hope that you learned a few things. I'm sure you did because, boy, I learned a couple of things too. So uh, go back and look at the program if you watched it live. There's a lot of stuff in here. But we're going to uh, head down the path and start getting all of our stuff lined up. We'll be back here one more day next Wednesday, but it's going to be pretty close to field day. Some people will already be out there, I guess. But uh, we'll look forward to having you next week. And uh, in the meantime, get on the air after nets. There's things happening everywhere, 75 meters, 40 meters, 20 meters. So let us know what's going on. What's going on on my phone here? Well, we'll see. I don't know. But uh, we'll talk to you guys and gas all next week. In the meantime, get on the air. K9EID from the Ozarks. Bye-bye for now. Bye, guys. Thirty-three.